I'm Amy Guitard, and this is Ingredient Insiders. This is Ingredient Insiders. I'm John Magazzino. And I'm Andrea Parkins. On each episode of Ingredient Insiders, we will be talking with chefs and writers about their favorite ingredients. We then speak to the producer of that ingredient. We learn its history, how it's made, and why chefs love to use it in their restaurants. All right, Andrea, so on Saturday, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Lauren and I were home. We were, you know, watching movies. And this was a particularly long movie, Mm -hmm. about three hours. In the middle of the movie, I I just had a hankering for something sweet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like, I went in the pantry and I saw these bags of guitar chocolate. And Did you just like open it and start eating it? Or did you want to like, what'd you do? I started talking to Lauren about like, what are the possibilities of what we could do here? And I said... I really am in the mood for a hot fudge sundae. That sounds amazing. I've never made a hot fudge sundae from scratch at my house. So I'm sure like, I've bought like the like you know, a jar Hershey's of, yeah. syrup or whatever. But Lauren made hot fudge from scratch out of guitar chocolate that we had a couple bags at home. It took her like two minutes. Like, Simple. did she make like a ganache with like cream and, and chocolate? I didn't even watch Andrea because <laughs> I was too busy making the whipped cream from scratch. But wow, that this is like a gourmet. She did Sunday. have a pot out. She did melt. I want to say there was butter and condensed. Oh, that was the thing. She said, "I'll make you hot fudge, but we need condensed milk." Ooh. Would you believe it? This was did you have this it in was your meant pantry? to be. Yeah, we had a can of condensed, Perfect. sweetened condensed milk in the pantry, yeah. and that was that sealed the deal. You know what else I really like in addition to a hot fudge sundae? What brownie sundae? Oh yeah. Like I am a big like as a kid, yeah. that was like a huge treat. Like a warm brownie, ice cream, hot fudge, whipped yes. cream, cherry. Oh. Uh, well, we had every... We didn't have cherries. I did make a comment about that. Ugh, you need the cherry. We, uh, we, we, yeah, what house doesn't have right. you know, cherries, houses, even yeah. just for like, uh, you know, cocktails and stuff. But in any event, we made this... Uh, we had Arethusa ice cream, which we bought at the store, you know, a couple days early. Uh, it, it just happened so spontaneously. Have and you seen an ice cream sundae on a menu in a long time? I haven't looked. But I mean, like for on dessert menus, if I go out to eat, I feel like... Someone needs to bring it's them back. It's a little lowbrow, but it, I love it, it was so good. I took some cashews. But you made it high. I had some bazzini cashews. I chopped them up and mm. sprinkled it on top. Like a wet walnut almost, you know? Yeah, like, I don't know what wet, but it was delicious. You've never heard of a wet walnut? No, it's a wet walnut. It's like like a walnut in like um like a sugar syrup, and you put them on Sundays. Oh, I, now I know what you're talking about, in we, like a sugar syrup. Yeah. Well, anyhow... We've digressed here, but we have, we're, but we're excited. I can't wait to talk about chocolate even more because we're going to be with Amy Guitard. Uh, you that, know, I mean, the, talk about legend. The namesake of her family, Guitar Chocolate in San Francisco. So we're here in San Francisco and we're going to talk to Amy Guitard all about chocolate. Mm. This season of Ingredient Insiders is brought to you by Bazzini Nuts. Bazzini is the brand of choice among chefs in the finest hotels and restaurants. Their legacy of quality extends to gourmet retail stores, specialty boutiques, grocery distributors, and delis, ensuring you have access to their extensive range of consumer retail packages. It all started in 1886 when Italian immigrant Anthony L. Bazzini began selling nuts by the pound to bakers, street vendors, and individuals during the Great Depression. But Bazzini Nuts isn't just about peanuts. They offer a delightful array of nuts like cashews, almonds, pecans, pistachios, hazelnuts, and more, plus a tempting selection of dried fruit, including apricots, cranberries, figs, dates, prunes, and tomatoes. So whether at the ballpark, in the kitchen, or indulging in some well-deserved self-care, choose Bazzini Nuts. With a legacy spanning 137 years, they're here to serve your needs with the same consistency, reliability, and quality, making them an iconic name in the world of nuts and dried fruits. Bazzini Nuts, tradition, quality, and taste all in one. Taste the legacy today. This episode is in partnership with The Chef's Warehouse and produced by Gotham Production Studios in New York City. Can you believe it, Andrea? We are back in the San Francisco Bay Area today. We've been waiting to do this interview for over a year now. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, but we're here. It's a sunny day. 
in California. I literally just walked off an airplane. Yeah. We're, we're got south in a car, of San Francisco. And are, we are now in a, the presence of greatness. <laughs> the queen of we chocolate. Are, we are with the queen of chocolate. We are at the Guitard <laughs> Chocolate Factory in Burlingame, California with Amy Guitard. Hi. This Thank is you so for awesome. being here with Hi. us today. I'm so excited to be here. And we can talk guys. about chocolate, oh. which is like the best thing on the planet. We have the best jobs. <laughs> like we really I always have ask this question when we talk about chocolate, just with friends. And Like, does anybody not like chocolate? Because if they don't, I don't think I really like could relate. Do you know what I'm talking about? Does you ever meet anybody who's like, I don't like chocolate? You know, I have, believe it or not, but I eat a lot of chocolate. Yeah. People always ask, do you you eat a lot of chocolate? Oh, I'm not a chocolate person. I'm like, really? I'm judging you. I mean, I had a bag of our semi-sweet chips at home and I am embarrassed to say that I ate over the course. I'm not embarrassed to say. Very proud to say this, but no. I um, I ate the entire bag over a shorter period of time than I'd like to That's admit. That's a badge Good of for honor, you. not yeah. anything yeah. to be embarrassed yeah, I, about. Just leaning into it. I keep bags of dark chocolate <laughs> in my cupboard and nosh on them continually. See, you know what though? Straight up. <laughs> Sometimes I even dip them in peanut butter. Oh, yeah. That's but the best. Whatever. You know, get a spoon of peanut butter and then you put the chips on top and then you eat it. You know what else is also really good? Mm. A date. Oh, oh yes. my God. Almond yes. butter and then a little. Yes. <sighs> yes. But you know what? Chocolate I'm chip. like. There's no wrong way ju- to eat chocolate. But is you're going to judge me because yeah. I prefer milk chocolate over dark chocolate. I'm going to judge you. I, I knew mean, you would. I, listen, I'm not against milk chocolate. It's just not a preference. I don't know if it's because I grew up with it. Um, more than dark chocolate, but I just like the creaminess. I like dark chocolate for me is like, I don't crave it. It doesn't you know, give me what I'm looking for though. The milk chocolate. I will. Uh, I appreciate your honesty. Cause yeah. I think a lot of people are afraid to admit yeah. that they love mm-hmm. milk chocolate. Interesting. I think there's a, right now everyone likes to tout really dark chocolate. Right. They like to say, you know, I, I love a 90% or, mm-hmm. a, you know. But milk chocolate is very nostalgic for a lot of people. Yeah. So I eat a lot of milk chocolate. I also eat a lot of dark chocolate. Yeah, that, I do. I that. actually even this, Amy I, Guitar said you're okay. Speaking of where we are, <laughs> like where where are we sitting right now? We are sitting in my dad's office, and actually, this wall behind you used to not be there. Um, when I was growing up, it used to be a big office, and it was shared between my dad, my grandfather, and my uncle. How many years have you been in this We've facility? We've been in this facility since 1954. So we were wow. in San Francisco. So we were founded in 1868 by my great-great-grandfather who came from France looking for gold. And he brought chocolate with him to trade for mining supplies. All right, well, let's slow down here because yeah. you just said a lot. Okay. So the company is over 150 <laughs> years old. Yeah. yeah. And your grandfather, I did some research, Andrea, mm-hmm. shocked that I did this. Etienne Guitard. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yep. Came to Northern California during the gold rush. Yeah. In the 1850s, 1849. Yep. Right? San Francisco 49ers. And was looking for gold. And how did the heck did he get into the chocolate business? But he, I, I, I read that he wasn't super successful with finding gold. Correct. Yeah. So he had brought, his uncle had a chocolate factory in France. So he brought chocolate from that chocolate factory to trade for mining supplies. And when he got here, he realized that the merchants were the ones that were making a bit more money than the gold miners. So he went back to France, which just like boggles my mind. I was thinking about this the other day. The idea of going from France to San Francisco is like a feat back unto in itself those days. and then going back and then coming back. Like I still don't totally know how, how that happened, but he did it. And he came back to San Francisco with um the he he went back to France to learn how to make chocolate from his uncle and then came back to San Francisco and opened our first factory, which was down on Sansom Street. So right along the Embarcadero. Uh-huh. Um but at the time there were all sorts of other sort of commodity companies. There was Hills Brothers Coffee, there was Folgers Coffee, um, there was Ghirardelli Chocolate. We're still, we're like the last family owned business that's sort of still standing, if you will. Um, And at the time, you couldn't sort of subsist on making one product. So we did, uh, chocolate's a grinding business. We can get into sort of how chocolate's made in yeah. a bit, mm-hmm. but um, it's sort of a series of, 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 um, of, grinding. Um, and so at the time we did anything that required grinding. So coffee, teas, spices, um, and chocolate. So we diversified our business and we were down on Sansom street. And then everyone knows the famous 1906 earthquake, um, which happened. And our 
factory destroyed burned the down um as did half this half of san francisco so the city burned down our factory was one of the buildings that um burned down and then we rebuilt um on main street so our, that was our second facility um and we were there until the early 1950s when my grandfather moved us down to Burlingame. So the city decided to build a freeway over that factory and imminent domain um, moved us down here and it was just farmland. So our, our, everyone wonders why our street is called Guitard Road. And I always have to say, well, there, there was nothing here. Yeah. So we just decided to name it after ourselves. So um, we've been here since 1954. There's a photo in the lobby of the groundbreaking with the mayor of Burlingame. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. And your dad has been running the company since the mid 1980s. Yeah. So as I said, this office um, was where my dad, grandfather and uncle used to all work together. Um, and I remember they were all in a different corner. And I remember as a kid coming to, to visit the office and running down the hall and coming into the office and seeing, you know, all of my grandfather and my uncle and my dad all working together. Um, my grandfather died from Lou Gehrig's disease in 1988. Um, and then very shortly thereafter, about six months later, my uncle um, died from a heart attack. So very suddenly. Um, and so my dad uh, was sort of moved into this role um, to, to run the company surprisingly and, um, you know, not not with the intention that that was anything that he was that he was going to be doing. Um, and a lot of the employees who were there then to sort of help keep the company going during a pretty tragic um, yeah. time are still with us today and, and helping. So um, as you know, we always say we're a family business through and through. You know, we've got second and third generation employees in the factory um, and then also here um, in, in the office. So as I said, a lot of the folks who are still here were, were there um, today working with my dad. Yeah. yeah. It's really yeah. incredible story. When you were running around as a little girl, did you imagine yourself working here? Like, or was it you something know, that you decided later on? I think I always sort of in my core was always thinking how fun it would be to, to work for my family business and work in such a unique industry. I mean, obviously when you're that little, you don't understand the sure. complexities, right? But, um, you know, the older I got and the more I got exposed to the business. I used to work here as a kid. I used to work in R&D and develop recipes and um, do tempering stuff you know, experiments and stuff like that. Um, so I think the, the more exposed I got to the business, the more I realized that it would be, uh, not just an honor to work for my family business, but also a really interesting industry to work in. Um, and in college, uh, I, I knew I wanted to work in food. Um, and I figured that why not sort of, um, enter the the space of food and sustainability I worked at cliff bar for a while and then um moved over to the family business after about seven years working elsewhere when so. you were a kid did all of your friends just they must yeah. have you must have had so you many were probably friends the most popular girl in school this is oh, I definitely her not. dad <laughs> I was owns the not. chocolate factory i, <laughs> I mean, was a big nerd how good like you know it's you like you probably had, like the best snacks or like the best chocolate chip cookies. I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, it's I funny. I just think bars we, of chocolate like being handed out. Like, like Halloween. To... <laughs> like, did you just... <laughs> we have to go to Amy's house. Did you grow up? That's a great question. Like, did you grow yeah. up in chocolate? Like, was there always chocolate around you? We had a lot of chocolate, but you know, it wasn't something that we had. I think because it was around a lot, it's like a lot of things. Like if it's around as a kid, you don't... You want what you don't have, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we baked every now and again, but it wasn't like a huge part of our of our sort of family traditions, if you will. Um, I do remember my dad would bring home. We used to have our cocoa powder samples come in like a, a metal tin with the top that you had to use like a knife to pop open. Mm -hmm. And there was a plastic bag inside that was filled with cocoa powder. Um, and I remember just like the feeling and the excitement about having that tin get pulled out from the cupboard and making, you know, hot chocolate with each other. Um, so there's like special moments like that that I think all of us as kids can remember. Um, but, you know, my dad would come home smelling like chocolate. Like back then you wore suits to work. Um, so he'd take off his tie. And I remember putting his tie on and having it, you know, smell like like chocolate. That's pretty but, good. Um, Better than like the New York City subway system. Yeah. <laughs> Not that that's what my dad smelled like, but still. Yeah. <laughs> um, your dad. We should talk about your dad. Yeah. Gary Guitard, because yeah. he was really a visionary in this industry and the business. Um, in the early 1990s, he really kind of changed the whole. Uh, you know, direction of the business yeah. to really make this an artisanal, super high end product, yeah. which it is today. So yeah. I guess up until then, what was it? And then how did he 
really take it to the next level. Yeah, I mean, I think we've always been focused on quality. You know, I think it's something that we pride ourselves on innovation and quality. I mean, even just looking at my great great grandfather who came, he was sort of had an eye toward innovation and entrepreneurship and sort of reinventing and rethinking. I think that's always sort of been at the core of who we are as a family and as a company and sort of an, an inspiration for looking towards the future. And I think, you know, we were we were always suppliers of of quality products. You know, we were making chocolate um, powders, chips, chunks um, uh, for the wide variety of the industry. And when I say industry, it's, you know, ice cream, baking, confection, um, sort of the gamut. Um, 80% of our business is B2B uh, and about 20%, if not less, is retail. So much um, more focused on people who were manufacturing versus yes. going to the store and picking out a chocolate bar off the yep. shelf and going home and eating it. Yep. Yeah. So, so chocolate as an ingredient, if you will, in, in a bigger product. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we take such great pride in that, right? Like I always talk about it as this evolution of artistry whereby, you know, working with a cocoa farmer, it's their job to, um, you know, cultivate and grow this beautiful cocoa bean that can then be used as, as an ingredient and the essence of chocolate. And it's our job to sort of honor that artistry um, that the farmer bestows on the bean and bring it to life and sort of bestow our own level of craft to it, to then give it to a pastry chef or confectioner, to then um, add their own level of creativity. So at the end, you sort of have this evolution of artistry um, that can They're be celebrated. Your chocolate. Yeah, yeah, or, or the in in reality, they're honoring yeah, the, the, the cocoa bean. Cocoa bean, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, so I think that. Uh, theory was a lot of the inspiration for how the business sort of evolved um, in the 90s, as you as you started to, mm-hmm. to reference. So um, in the 90s, John Scharfenberger um, st- sort of created his brand um, that was really redefining how chocolate was being made. Um, and that inspired us to sort of rethink what we were doing. I mean, that was just in our backyard. That was in Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my dad, Gary, sort of took a look at how we were doing our business and thinking, well, how could we do things differently? And I think it's always healthy for for even ourselves to look at how do we live our lives differently, how, you know, to, to break that cycle. And so thus started a whole process of rethinking how we craft, um, where we source from, what, how we're sourcing. And um, from a, many, many years of tinkering and, and he really – He's always, he's always, I always describe my dad as a little bit of a mad scientist, like in the best way possible. You know, he really digs into things and wants to do the best of the best. Um, And so thus emerged uh, our brand eGuitard. And then that sort of had a, I think some people might know it as eGuitard or Collection Etienne. Um, And that was really our first uh, entry into Couverture, um, which as many folks know, is a chocolate that has uh, more cocoa butter in it to help with flow properties. Um, And cocoa butter is an expensive ingredient in the chocolate making process. And so um, by nature, it's a little bit of a higher price point. Um, It's oftentimes used to coat confections, um, ganache, mousse, um, all sorts of sort of the the variety of applications that we all know and love and Mm -hmm. and make their way into pastry kitchens around the world. Um, And so So, you know, it was application driven. It was also uh, flavor driven. So really looking at where we were sourcing our beans, which has always been pivotal. My my grandfather went to West Africa, um, you know, way back in the day. Um, And so sourcing, again, has always been a really important and grower relations has always been really important to, to us as a company. But again, looking at how how flavor was being um, brought to life in our finished product was really um, elevated in that line. Um, And we oftentimes say like that e-guitar line really made us rethink everything that we do and how we craft um, and where we source from. So it was a, it was a really important step in the evolution of the company um, and, and is inspiration for now when we, when we come up with new products. Let's talk a little bit about that, the sourcing yeah. and how, how chocolate made. is made, really. like, Tell us a little bit about where Guitar sources their cacao. Is it cacao or cocoa beans? Cacao. 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 Yeah. Cacao. cacao. I love saying cacao. cacao. Yeah, it's a fun cocoa. word. Yeah. Um, the Abroma cacao. So talk to <laughs> us about Guitar and where you source your beans yeah. from. Mm-hmm. And, how, how, and how is chocolate really made? Yeah. What is that process? Mm-hmm. I will try to... Um, simplify it. Readers as, Digest. As, yeah, Readers Digest. So um, 
we source from all over the world. So cocoa grows 10 to 15 degrees, more or less either side of the equator. Some people say 15 to 20. Um, it's called the cocoa belt. So um, again, we source all over the world. For us, it's really all about um, the flavor diversity and making sure that we are getting beans from regions that can, uh, you know, which is lot, all the regions um, that we can use and celebrate in our chocolate products. So we source from Madagascar, Tanzania, Ghana, Ivory Coast, um, Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, um, Hawaii. Hawaii is the northernmost region where cocoa grows. Um, and so it's our, our single origin Hawaiian mm -hmm. is sort of an American made, if you will, chocolate. It's grown in the States and then we make it here, um, which is kind of a, a it's fun, really cool, cool thing to say. Um, we did a, a chocolate tour in Hawaii on our honeymoon. Oh. It was amazing to which see what I they're doing on. in Maui. Okay. They, yeah. it seems like that it's like that one company that I'm missing the name on. Okay. Uh, Hawaiian chocolate tours. Is that <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually like very expensive. Yeah. Um, and, but very delicious. Oh, good. So, yeah. Good. I'm glad. Um, so we source from all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, and we, um, you know, a lot of these relations we've had for a while, um, and we go to origin often. Uh, I haven't been in a while because I just had a baby, and <laughs> congratulations, <laughs> of COVID, thanks. Um, but yeah, we we have programs um, in a lot of these countries and um, with with particular farms, and again flavor is really important. So where cocoa grows, um, it gets uh, harvested twice a year typically, um, and it's fermented and dried prior to shipping. Um, and the fermentation and drying is really crucial to flavor development. And so a lot of what we do um, working with farmers is making sure that they've got appropriate sort of infrastructure to be able to dry on drying beds um, and ferment properly. And and we will oftentimes get samples from farmers and make like a little bench top sample of chocolate and mm -hmm. then engage in a dialogue with them about ways that they can improve some of the post-harvest practices that they're doing on the farm, um, which is a really important piece because it's, it's a lot about um, allowing them to get a premium for their product. And then also just, again, kind of harkens back to what I was mentioning earlier about celebrating the flavor and really bringing to life everything that that bean is capable of of um, uh, sort of flavor wise conveying. And so engaging in that collaboration and dialogue with farmers is really crucial. Um, Do you and have long standing relationships with like some farmers that you've oh, been yeah. working with for a long time? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, relationships is such a pivotal part, sure. for, especially in food, um, right. you know, and it's not like we're a winery and we can walk out our door and see our grapes. You know, it's it's our the es essence of our of our product is grown far from where we live. We do have a cocoa tree in our in our um, entry. Vestibule. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful <laughs> in our office. But um, we've tried it doesn't produce enough. We've huh? tried harvesting the beans, and it was a little bit actually. All those those are little mini um, cocoa trees that were um, little that we've been growing from seedlings. It's like a That's greenhouse funny. in here that my dad waters him every oh, every morning, cute. his little cocoa tree seedlings. But um, yeah, I digress. So um, yeah, cocoa grows 10 to 15 degrees either side of the equator. We get cocoa from all over the world. Um, and once we uh, accept the bean, so all of our raw material is um, tested prior to accepting it in for quality. Um, so we'll do like a little uh, mini liquor sample of our beans before we accept the lot. Um, so we'll do a cut test. So you basically put the the beans and like looks like a little guillotine you cut them crosswise and you can tell a lot from the quality of a bean just by looking at um the quality of of, of its appearance mm -hmm. so the fissures tell tell you about the fermentation you can look for mold you can look for um infestation and you can also look for really qual uh, positive qualities like the color of it will indicate good fermentation and, and things like that so we do first do a cut test and then we'll do like a uh liquor sample so we'll do a, a lab roast um and then we'll grind it and make a little um, liquor out of it and we'll taste it. So every day at 1130, we have a cross-functional team that tastes um, raw materials. So beans, sugar, things like that. Um, and then we'll also test product that's being made. Um, and if anything tastes off, um, we'll, you know, look into it and, and reconfigure it. So, yeah. Andrea, would, like, would you like that job, Andrea? It isn't. Where you get to like, we missed it, John. Oh, you wanted to be the, the taste <laughs> I'm tester? I'm sad. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. You missed it by 10 minutes? Next yep. time. Next um, time. Um, Next time. I have a question. Yeah. Do you, do you does, does guitar make single origin chocolates with those different producers we in do. different regions? Yeah. So, um, 
back when eGuitar first started, we started doing single origins. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in like the early 90s. And we had a whole sort of suite of them. You can tell a lot about chocolate tasting by just tasting single origins. So mm -hmm. I kind of describe it, there's blends. So a blend um, is made up of a bunch of different beans. And then you also have your single origins and they both have different purposes. I think a lot of people sort of frown upon blends um, just because it's a blend of beans sure. and single origins are sort of celebrated um, mm -hmm. for a whole host of other reasons, but they each have their purpose in a kitchen, right? Um, you know, a blend sometimes is easier to mix with different ingredients um, and it's sort of more... Um, like a workhorse? Uh, yeah, it could be, a, exactly. That's yeah. a great term to use. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's more versatile. For instance, you could pair it with a nut. You could also probably pair it with a fruit versus a single origin that might be a little bit more pointed one way or another where mm -hmm. you're sort of... Um, the how it can be paired is a little bit more narrow, but um, the cost benefit might be a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it could be more exponential flavor explosion versus <laughs> something that's a little bit more narrow. So each has its own own place in the kitchen. Um, but yeah, we do make single origins. Um, we have a single origin Hawaiian. Uh, we have a single origin Madagascar, Ecuador, Peru. Um, and then we also have blends that are comprised of like eight different beans. Um, you know, we do, when we're developing a new chocolate, we do a variety of iterations. We've got, again, a cross-functional team of, of folks who are tasting and we're constantly tinkering and trying to figure out, you know, if it's at this percentage and it'll likely be used at this application, what beans should we put in it? And when will the flavors of each bean sort of come out on your palate as you're tasting? You know, if you want it to end on a sour note, but start off with chocolate, what beans can deliver that? Um, so it's it's a really interesting process of, of um, backing into designing a product um, and and blends allow you that to do, to do that. But single origins are, are also great. Also different percentages of single origins um, are also really interesting to look at. You know, you've got a single origin Madagascar mm -hmm. that's maybe a milk chocolate could taste very different from a dark Madagascar single origin. Sure. Um, cause milk, it's like a ganache, you know, if you're making mm -hmm. a ganache, um, with a, with a single origin, that milk is going to like totally change the delivery of flavor. Um, so this anyway. question might be a little basic, but we have a lot of pastry chefs who listen to sure. the podcast that really know all about chocolate production. But for those who don't talk about what, what are the different percentages that are available today, you know, yeah. starting at the low end with milk chocolates and then going up to the, you know, extremely uh, high concentrations of, of cocoa? Yeah. Cocoa, yeah. Am I saying that right? Co cacao. Cacao. <laughs> cacao. <laughs> cacao. Cacao. Um, <laughs> You know, and what, how do, what is the difference? What makes something a 70% yeah. versus a 55%? It is a great question. Okay. Um, percent cacao is comprised of both um, your added cocoa butter and the uh, cocoa butter that's inherent in the bean. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned earlier, Couverture has added cocoa butter to it. Beans more or less are 50% fat, 50% solid. So when we get the beans in, um, we roast them first and then we grind them. When you grind them, um, it's like... Uh, grinding peanuts and you get peanut butter, it goes from a solid nut to something that's a little bit more viscous, right? Um, and so that fat is inherent in cocoa beans as well. And so when you're making a chocolate that has added cocoa butter, like an Ecuador, for instance, has like a little bit less fat than say a Ghana, but more or less it's 50-50. So when you grind that bean, you're you have the inherent fat that's in the bean and then you'll add cocoa butter to it. So but not all chocolate has added cocoa butter, right? So mm -hmm. a, a baking chip has less fat added to it. That's why it looks the way that it does. It's why it's sort of um, architecturally more sort of upright versus a, a wafer or a fev that's more of like a puddle. That's because it has added cocoa butter to it. Got it. Um, so uh, that being said, so now we know sort of the basics of mm -hmm. the science of, an, mm -hmm. of, a, of a cocoa nib, for instance, um, and, and cocoa beans, once you're making a chocolate, say um, a 60%, I'm gonna use this, let's see if I can do my math properly. A 60% that has no added cocoa butter to it is different than a 60% that has say 10% added cocoa butter to it. So if you can, vi I'm a visual person. So mm -hmm. if you have a 60% with 10% um, uh, added cocoa butter, you basically have a 50% and then 10% added. I'm using my fingers to count right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, 
Um, and so <laughs> another way to think about it too is like a 90% that seems really, really dark could have 10% added cocoa butter to it. So 90% with added cocoa butter is going to taste less strong than like an 85 that has no added cocoa butter. Got it. Makes sense. Which I think is really important for people to understand because it affects the rheology. It affects if you're using a chocolate. That's why everyone likes to know total fat in your mm -hmm. chocolate product yeah. because it's going to affect your your end recipe. Um, and so when we're designing products and how much fat gets added, it also has to do with the flavor delivery. Um, cocoa butter has flavor to it, but not as much flavor as a nib as like a so as cocoa solids, for instance. So it all sort of goes goes take into account um, in terms of our formulation of mm -hmm. our end products and the rheology. And then also thinking about how it's going to be used. You know, if it's a if it's a chip or a, or a product with a little bit less fat, it might be more design better suited for like a ganache because mm -hmm. you're already adding fat into that end mm -hmm. end right. product. Um, but yeah, co uh, percentages is a really important topic, and I think one that um, really affects how a chef would would use the product, also our formulation, and then just the overall flavor delivery. Is there a like most desired percentage? Like I'm a I'm a seventy percent chocolate guy. I, was, I, I just knew you were gonna say it. I'm a seventy guy. Mm -hmm. What are you? I'll go in. You know, I can get into the like mid seventies. Mm -hmm. Above that, I I guess it's too much. A it's too like too. For me. And I'm yeah. just talking strictly about eating and most baking stuff that I do. I'm curious what you guys feel about that like percentage. I mean. I think that there's a place for everything. Yeah. I'm not just being diplomatic, but I do think that different beans do better at different percentages. Um, and, you know, I think we're constantly talking about that when we're designing new products or even reflecting on our existing product mix. Mm -hmm. Like, is this, is this right? Um, Cause think, I'm sure like all, like you like 70, but not all 70% are created equal. N no, I get it. So, well, also it. you could have a 70% with added cocoa butter. You could right. also have a 70 so yeah. we get 60% plus 10%. Which I think is a really important point. You know, when people say these these grandiose statements, as I may mm -hmm. say, yeah. like, oh, I love a 70%. You know, like, well, why? Is it because of the way the flavor is being delivered? Or is it because there's pride in the percentage? Um, or is it because it's more well-rounded? We have a 61% that is like a workhorse, as you said, mm -hmm. that works really well in a lot of different applications. And it's a 61%. Yeah. Um, but, you know... It's, I think I think a lot of people like that seventy range. It seems to be a fan favorite, so you're mm -hmm. not alone. So there we go. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, you also have folks who who pride themselves on on the darker, the darker chocolates. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I it, I'm not being diplomatic. I don't think. But I I like all percentages. And sure. you like the milky stuff. And I, I do. I, I, I love a creamy, milky, yeah, caramelly yes, kind of chocolate for sure. I mean. Anything below forty, definitely intense. You know, like I would say, forty is probably forty-two. Like, that's well, where that, you want to be. That, well, but, but like, it depends on the the bean, right? But what about um, a dark milk chocolate? That's really so, in vogue right now. It is. I like that. I, I saw it in that Hawaii. I've had a lot of dark milk chocolate. I didn't. I, it was still like, for me, at the end, like the bitterness from the dark, it overpowered mm. the the milk. Yeah. So I pref I still prefer straight milk and everyone, you know, feel free to judge, but I, I don't know. So I have another question for you sure. with your milk chocolates. Do you like, like a sour dairy note or like a fresh dairy note? More fresh. Okay. Yeah. But I do like the, like the caramel notes, like where, you know, sometimes they caramelize the milk solids, mm -hmm. which is, you know, to me, it, it just adds more depth and richness to it. Um, that's typically where I go. Yeah. But what about like, what are the most I don't want to, I, most popular percentages that Egotard, you know, sells to chefs. Yeah. So Egotard was, was, um, because we like to confuse everyone. Oh. Egotard was the, it was actually quite ironical to share a little anecdote. It was during the nineties, right? When mm -hmm. everything was like dot com. Yeah. So it was Egotard and everyone thought that it was some sort of web, you know, right. www dot, you know like some play yeah, during on the tech yeah. yeah very confusing so then e-guitar became well actually started off i believe as collection etienne then it became e uh -huh. and then we went back to collection etienne um okay. in like i don't know 
10, 15 years ago. Um, so it's currently called Collection Etienne. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, I guess it's I, have, I, I think it's because maybe when I started using it. No. Or I, I mean, don't know. I no just, apologies. Okay. No apologies. It is you're you're tapping into the history of the company. So there you go. I would or, say I mean, embrace it. I was feeling Silicon nostalgic Valley here either, so I get the confusion. <laughs> totally. Um, uh, actually, the poster above you says E Guitard and Co. So, See, I was you know, just the reading the poster is like above my head. Spot on. <laughs> um, but you know, I think we have a. a, a wide palette of different types of um of flavors and i I mentioned that 61 Mm percent which a lot of folks like we also you know have some products that are a little bit more chocolate up front um versus some that are a little bit more um you know less less hit you over the head with chocolate that a little bit more subtle that might be a little Mm -hmm. bit more um fruity or floral or things like that i'm thinking like pastry chefs are listening and they're like hmm i want to try this yeah like Maybe what are some directions of, you know, if you're making a mousse or if you're making a a ganache, what percentages would you recommend? Yeah. So I would say like our 61% is really great for enrobing. Okay. Um, We have two pastry chefs on staff, Donald Russell and Josh Johnson. Um, We have a chocolate studio down in LA where we teach Mm -hmm. classes and Donald, both of them do a lot of work around R&D. And in their enrober, they usually have our 61%. Um, It's just, it works really well with a lot of different... um, you know, fills and and things like that. Um, uh, And if they're doing like shell molding, they might use our 38% um, milk chocolate. There you go. um, Sort of switch things up Mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, But I think for, you know, those are sort of the the common place for for confection. Um, All of them work really. I don't, I'm not just saying this. I think they all work really well based on whatever the pastry chef is. I'm not a pastry chef. Um, I, I wish that I had that knowledge, but I would never sort of, I, I would maybe make some recommendations, but I, I would always encourage a pastry chef to try out if they're not familiar with our product line to just try it out and, um, and, and see what works well for what they're after. Um, you know, I always, I, pastry chefs are creatives unto themselves and I would never want to, you know, tell someone you're only supposed to use this for that. That was a thought that I I was going to ask, and it's a very practical question, which is pastry chefs, as you mentioned, are super creative. There are also a lot that are very, um, I don't want to say set in their ways, um, but if if you grew up using a particular type of chocolate that your mentor, chef, you know, you either learned about it while you were in culinary school or you learned about it in the first restaurant and you fell in love with it, how does a chef that may have been using, you know, a French chocolate for years, yeah. but is curious about guitar and wants to use, you know, the best American chocolate in the world, one of the best chocolates in the world, how do they, what's the best way for them to go about learning about the guitar product and trying it in their kitchen? Yeah. I think you're raising a really important point. I mean, I think, um, we all have brand allegiances and, you know, I think that, um, I always say pastry chefs are much like chocolate makers. It's that art and science. Um, and I think that there's there's tremendous beauty in those sort of how they feed into each other. And there's so much creativity and work that happens. The last thing that people want to do is change an ingredient and have to change all their formulas if, you know, they – really are jazzed on a product that might have a different fat content than something that they're used for and they want to, or used to, and they want to sort of try it out. Um, we have what we call fundamentals. So Donald and Josh are, are pastry chefs, as I mentioned, they, um, uh, have worked through basically a series of, um, I think it's a ganache, a mousse and, uh, forgetting what the third one is. Um, but, uh, uh, Cremeux. Mm-hmm. Knew it. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a, a ganache and mousse cremeau for all of our products within the Etienne line. Um, and that way it's sort of like an easy formula and it's the base, basically the building blocks for any confection or um, plated dessert. Uh, if you, if there's a, a need to develop a product using a different item, um, they've built it all out. So that's like a really easy cheat sheet. Um, but I also just say like taste and play, you know, it's like one of the most enjoyable experiences is like having a new, new chocolate to play with. And we do this all the time, not just with our own line, but like, you know, things that we find in the market and tasting it against 
common ingredients, you know, taste it with a banana Mm -hmm. or taste it with a, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here with pastry Mm -hmm. chefs, but, but exploring how it comes to life paired with other things. I made a reference to when chocolate's made like with in a ganache, it tastes totally different than just eating it on its own. Um, Similarly, when you taste a chocolate with another ingredient as like basic as, as that pairing could be, just take a bite of a banana, a bite of chocolate and see what it tastes like. Like that's a really interesting way too of play playing with flavor. Um, but yeah, I think the fundamentals are a really crucial way. It kind of cuts out all of the the math and makes it really simple to try something, um, new and different. Um, but we always say like, like if it's like, if, if you've got a chocolate that works well for you with your dessert, great. Um, you know, but, you know, I think that there's always different flavor profiles that are meant to, to work with different, different chefs or different desserts. There's obviously many great attributes to guitar chocolate. Yes. It's made in America. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful family business. Yes. Five generations. A rich history. We're sitting here with generation with number Guitard, five I mean, who couldn't be lovelier. Chocolate royalty. California. I love the history of all of it. Mm-hmm. It's American made. The quality is second to none. Why, like, what else are we telling pastry chefs? Why should they be using this chocolate? I mean, you're so kind to say all that. I mean, I I appreciate it very much. I mean, what your family built. I mean, this, like, the history in this room and this building, it's, I mean, I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. I mean, I think it's, I get, um, I'm very, um, I get very emotional thinking about sort of the history of of our company and sort of the passion. Um, and when I say passion, it's just it sounds a little like cheesy, but it's it's about sort of the the five generations of um, guitar family members. But again, like generations of folks who work in the factory and customers who we've served multiple generations. I mean, I think the food industry is and confection and pastry. It's so tight knit. It's such a, um, a a tight community and it's an honor to sort of be a a pivotal ingredient in that, um, and be able to bring to life this product that's grown, um, from the ground and the earth and then, um, turn it into this beautiful, this product. So, um, you know, I think you said such wonderful things about the company. Um, you know, I think we just have a real passion for innovation and, you know, I think one of the things I alluded to it just in terms of how we work with, with cocoa farmers and sort of that collaboration, we sort of take the same approach with pastry chefs too, you know, like having that dialogue and understanding what the needs are in the marketplace. And we are, uh, small family business and being able to dialogue with pastry chefs about what they need and um, what's out there in the market and what's missing and um, whether it's application specific or flavor specific, like that's where we love to, to where that's where we thrive and, and that camaraderie around um, what, what we do um, and working together to make the best of the best. Yeah. When Andrea and I were talking about this episode Mm -hmm. and we started to look at some of the pastry chefs and restaurants around the country that are using guitar, it's like a who's who of some of the greatest restaurants, not just in America, but in the world. And that brings me to another question, which I'll say in a second, but Spago, Beverly Hills, Wolfgang Pucks, Mm -hmm. you know, Blue Hill at Stone Barns. Uh, 11 per se. Madison Park, yeah. like these Michelin three-star world-class restaurants are using this chocolate. And, and that speaks to your success and, you know, what, you, what, what you're doing is working. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, that means a lot. What yeah. I, I was going to ask is, do you export your chocolate? We around do. Around the world? Will Europeans yeah. use an American <laughs> chocolate? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, John. Yeah, no, it is a really good question. We um, we have a fair amount of distribution in the UK. Um, and I remember doing a tasting with um, media and it was sort of right when we were sort of starting to, to distribute out there. And I was terrified. I was like, oh no, like this is, and there were some skeptics in the room and we did a tasting and, um, it, it, and you know, it was a really enjoyable day. Um, but you know, I think that there's always that, you know, European American, that, that sort of dynamic and dialogue and, right. you know, it is what it is, but, but you know, it's interesting, um, and this is not a knock on French chocolate or Italian chocolate or Swiss chocolate for that matter. It's the, you know, I don't want to say that there was a food revolution in the 90s, but Mm -hmm. American food and restaurants is as at a level as high as anywhere on the planet. Absolutely. 
And I can see that there was a period, obviously, where maybe European restaurants may have dominated in, you know, a, a, I don't want to say it's the 1950s, 60s, 70s, whatever, That's but what the there was a period. Arab, that popped into my head. But the, yeah. the fact of the matter is that the raw materials for making chocolate come from tropical places, right? Yep. And the actual chocolate, you know, why isn't it that America shouldn't have the best chocolate in the world? I think... I think, we, I think here. Amy would say that, that we do. I'm just, you know, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here maybe, but it's like... No, I think you're right. I think people have to really open up their minds and start to think about what makes something great. And it's not just that, yes, there's a history in Europe and the U.S., but there's history here. I mean, this is 150 years. Absolutely. I mean, you're and you're talking about, you know, five generations taking that history from Europe and bringing it here and, and being able... It's, I mean, it's the American dream, really. Yeah. yeah. I think there's something that is also really interesting that we have we talk about here is the importance of buying local, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like when you are sourcing your um, fruits or your lettuces or, you know, all sorts of ingredients that you go to the farmer's market down the street. You know, we have the Ferry Building Farmer's Market here every Thursday. Chefs go and, you know, mm -hmm. buy ingredients and things like that. And, you know, the importance of, of buying local can to the degree that you can for products that are, you know, you mentioned it, cocoa isn't grown in San Francisco, unfortunately. I would love nothing more than to be able to walk out and be able to, sure. to look at cocoa trees, as I said, I can we can in our lobby, the tiny little <laughs> pods. But, um, you know, I think that there's really something interesting about reflecting on what local means when you look at, at uh, you know, products beyond the, mm -hmm. the, the ones that can grow in your backyard. Um, so I think that's another way of looking at it. Um, but yeah, again, like it, it's the diversity of flavor is something that we celebrate in the products that we make, but also recognize that the diversity of flavor globally and in, in all, in all sorts of ingredients is important. Um, but I, you know, I, again, I really appreciate the, the comments that you're making about our quality and we do take tremendous pride in it. Um, and it's something that we've, um, sort of evolved over five generations and really will stand behind our product and believe it is the best of the best. Absolutely. I, I mean, mean, I'm going to just throw the challenge out. If you're a pastry chef ooh. and you're listening oh. to this episode <laughs> and you've only ever worked with one chocolate and it doesn't matter which one it is, but you haven't worked with Guitard, you need to go out, ask your chef's warehouse sales rep for yep. samples. Call Laura if you're in New York <laughs> who's working the streets. We will get for you, you some working for samples. Guitard. We'll get you the samples, but open your mind. And I think you absolutely it's like this chocolate's that good. That 100%. it needs to be oh, you guys. like have people open their eyes to it. Well, and I think too, like there's we have so much that's exciting stuff that's coming. Um I, I was really gonna talk. ask. I can't really talk about <gasps> it. But we have a lot of really exciting stuff that's coming that, you know, and um I think there's, we're always looking, you know, we describe it as like a toolbox. Um, there's a palette, whether it's your, the artist palette or the, I don't know what toolbox, but um, different tools and needs for different, you know, applications, for instance. And we're always looking at expanding what that is, whether it's a particular rheology or a particular flavor profile. If we find a new bean, we are super excited about it and we want to do something cool with it. Um, and so, you know, I think that, as I said, we've got a lot of really exciting stuff um, that, we're, that we're working on that's to come. So, um, yeah, samples abound. Yeah, and stay if, tuned. Yeah, yeah. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so I much. Have one, I have one oh, last question there because I've been oh, staring wait. at this thing oh, on the... and then I have a question. Okay, you want to go first? I'll go first. And then you're, you, I know you're... I, yeah, yeah. I have a feeling I know what your question yeah, yeah, is. Yeah, whatever. What is this cool-looking... Is it a metal block? Is it Ooh, a? It's very floor? heavy. It's very heavy. Feel yeah, that. it's got guitars on yeah. it, and then it's you know you could, guitar. You could hurt somebody with that. Like that could be a weapon. It should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I believe it's a blank for a mold, like a chocolate mold. Right. But if you look really closely, it's a little rusted now. Um, there's guitars on it. Yeah, it's um, so cool. And when you guys were double checking that you were pronouncing the company name correctly, which is uh, more often than, than not. Um, I described it that it's like the instrument with a D at the end and an extra T, but that part didn't matter when this it comes so to cool. pronun pronunciation. So back in the day, um, I mentioned the other, uh, chocolate company with a G mm -hmm. in it. Um, P 
people still get us very confused. And we, yep. So I find it funny that we have ephemera like that that indicates that for many, many years we've been challenged with that. So there was a time um, in our history where we added guitars um, to molds to show that um, it's. A, this how to how pronounce it, it, and yeah. B, that it's different from it's that other. It's guitar with a D, Andrea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Guitar. Guitar. Andrea, or if you're French, us. you don't pronounce the D. And it's guitar. 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 Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is a woman who doesn't Andrea's speak French. Andrea's been sitting no, here anyway. for 45 just minutes chomping just at waiting the bit. to go at this question. This is a favorite This is a favorite question. I think everyone every likes episode. this. Every yeah, episode. Yeah, every episode. All right. So we ask every guest, there are five favorite or must have pantry staples oh well you didn't goodness. ask her if she cooks at home yet do you cook at home i do cook at home oh, okay so there you go yeah. now you're in a I really knew she good cooked place at home. we've already chatted and she lives in northern california yes. so you know it's this is gonna be a good one <laughs> yes so what are the five pantry staples you must have at all times in your home oh boy are we doing savory or sweet what, whatever whatever, you, like. whatever you want five items okay um can they be in the refrigerator i'm gonna do brand can be in the, be in the refrigerator I'm brand agnostic Okay. Yeah, so I'm just fun. gonna yeah, I'm yeah. just gonna say ingredients. You could say like olive oil. Olive oil. Okay. Um uh salt, like mm-hmm. thin it like big Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um like a mal- want, she didn't want to say yeah, yeah, yeah. Maldon, but she meant Maldon. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes. Flake, about, like Thank flake you. salt. I'm joking, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Flake okay. flake salt. Yes. Um so <laughs> olive oil, Maldon five, only five. We could do yeah, more. We got two. Okay. You know what? I'm gonna say something. Just we could sit here all day and name no, 100. I think I like five. But I think moving forward, yeah. I'm omitting olive oil, salt, and, and salt. Why? That's what... I, but I, like everyone... Yeah. You're, oh, yeah, so everyone. you're not allowing them to have yeah, their... Yeah, like, because I want to hear... Oh, so you... Okay, so like you could say olive like, oil and salt, but then like, they like should you do want another... spices. Those don't count towards your... They don't your count towards your five, five. Okay. ingredients. So okay, now well, you I'm have still five going. new okay. ones. Okay. All right, so like, I'm sorry. Butter. Okay. And because I am... Um, bake a lot Mm -hmm. i'd say flour yeah um chocolate i mean i ate an entire bag but she is brand agnostic for chocolate yeah Yeah. (laughs) touche (laughs) um oh man uh do you keep all different types of chocolate just curious do you have a lot of different types of chocolate i have a little section in my cupboard that has like a bunch of different Wafers, percentages bars, and all that. different cocoa powders. Okay. I mean, that's a whole other episode of like yeah. the difference between cocoa powders. We didn't like, even get there. I bet, no. she, I bet we Amy did not makes get there. amazing like chocolate chip cookies at her oh, house. Yeah. Or what like do you brownies? make with your chocolate? Make cakes? I, I'm like a, I make br- brownies. I mean, Yum. I used to do a lot more baking, mm-hmm. um, but now and like laborious baking and enjoying sort of the process of yep. it. Um, but now I do things that I like have made so many times that I just, I don't need the recipe. You know, we right. have like a really amazing um, brownie. You know, some people are in like, I'm digressing from your question. No, it's but no, some people I'm are in like the, I want the fudgy brownie, brownie camp. I'm also camp. getting hungry right now, but yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> some people are in the like fudgy brownie camp. Some people are in the like cakey brownie camp. Yeah. I'm a fudgy brownie I'm fudgy. girl. What are you? I'm a fudgy cakey yeah. guy. Yeah. Oh, a fudgy cake. You have to be one, John. <laughs> no, I don't. I like them both. Okay, fair. I do love. I'll fudgy. allow it. So, like a like a fudgy brownie made with our 100. I mean, I'm using our retail products, so mm-hmm. our 100 baking bars, um, which we have available. Well, anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> lots of digressions in this conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, then we have like an organic cocoa powder. We also have a Dutch cocoa powder. So. I have both in the cupboard. So yes, I have a lot of, but I'm just mm-hmm. doing a, a large bucket of like chocolate. chocolate is, yeah. One of the ingredients. God, this is like a very weird top five plus olive oil, salt, butter, flour, chocolate. Mm-hmm. Two more. Two more. Um, I need like a, uh, I'm going to go with like a, um, some sort of spice. I'm thinking of all the spices that I have, but like a like a heat, some sort of heat. Mm-hmm. Um, I love how like could be so pepper many flakes. Yeah, like Could-y. crushed pepper flakes. Yeah, I'm just trying to pick which one. Let's could go with crushed, Spanish, crushed pepper flakes. Like pimenton, pimenton, but could be anything. Okay, crushed yeah. red pepper flakes. Okay. We don't want to put Sounds ideas little, in your head. No, basic, yeah, I, I, no, no, no. You're yeah. helping me because I had like a bunch of different in my head, but like, okay, it's a little am, basic, yeah. but we'll go with crushed red pepper flakes. Yeah. And then um, I guess we'll go with lemon. I like it. Love it. Acidity. Yeah. Yes. Well, I love it. There's a lot of common denominators when people answer that question. Yep. 
lemon and comes up a lot. And what you said is yeah. very much in the realm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The heat. I'm always surprised that so many chefs say hot sauce. Like, oh, interesting. That heat component. Because, I mean, I'm like a hot sauce yeah. freak. Do you like chocolate combined with pepper heat? <sighs> well, that's a good question. It's a really that's good a... question because I'm very torn. Yes. I like there's a part of me that thinks it's like a little kitschy. Yeah. Like, I don't think they. But there's then, a lot of history in that, isn't right. it? Like Mayans. Right. There's, yeah, there's a little history there. But chocolate. what about know. mint and chocolate? That's also very polarizing. In my ice cream, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I like mint and chocolate. I, this is something that another, another judgment. I don't like chocolate and orange. Oh, I love oh. chocolate and orange. I don't. I, I love, don't like orange. I love chocolate flavored dipped, things. Orange, oh, candied yeah. orange. Just oh, like, so I delicious. Can eat those, like, Me too. Like I love oranges and like all the varieties. Like but the who car, am I kidding? Car. I could eat like those candy store well, thin the, mints. But not those, thin, oh, thin mints. What, I are the, mean, what are the mints? Like a peppermint patty. Forget yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Peppermint oh. patty. Well, and then you break the peppermint patty and it goes. Tss. Yes. Oh, it oh it it's like, oh, like yeah. shh. It's mm-hmm. like a noise. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That's but does Target make any come... finished chocolates? Like mm, any? No. no like you didn't quote unquote get into that. confections? Yeah. No, we don't. I mean, I think that like sometimes we'll go to a trade show and we'll be making, you know, chocolate chip cookies and people get very confused. They're like, right. do you, are do you, you sell the chocolate cookies? Chip cookies? And we're like, right. no, we're just showing how it's like yeah. really delicious in an application. Yeah. Um, but no, we, we don't. We leave that up to the experts. But um, uh, yeah, going back to the chocolate covered orange peels, um, I think they sous vide the orange peels. And the, I mean, it is like a very laborious mm-hmm. process. So you like chomp those down like no nobody's business oh, yeah. but and the amount of, of like labor that goes into those when yeah. they're done right is yeah anyway just think got, about that john next yeah, time you're, you're like, so maybe i should have added orange peels to my um yeah my pantry we'll allow you to add that to your pantry <laughs> we've we'll add it to the submission all right well we have had this so has been much fun. this is john i this Andrew, is my say it go ahead i'm listening top five Top five. Oh, top five. yay. Top five. I didn't even know we were going to go into top fives now. Top five. Very <laughs> nice. I really enjoyed this. This was like. Uh, me too. It's been great. This is great. No, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. We've been chatting a lot and yeah. it's been, yeah, so much been, fun. Thank it's you. so fun. So Thank great. you guys. We really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having us here. Oh my God. I'm and for glad. being a partner at Chef's Warehouse. Guitar chocolate. It's the American chocolate. It's so great. Go to the store and buy some now. Yeah, the store. No, go to Chef's Warehouse. Oh, oh wait, the well, the store, right, Chef's whatever. Warehouse. This will all get edited out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ingredient Insiders. Follow us on Instagram at Ingredient Insiders. You can find the products we've discussed on today's episode at chefswarehouse.com or at your favorite specialty retailer. 